Thank you, uh, thank you, Lee, for that introduction, and uh, happy to be here to uh, try and uh, get some other views, uh, maybe a European view on Australia, which is obviously a bit pretentious as well. Um, and I think uh, going to my uh, first sheet, very recognizable, and probably uh, most of what uh, is linked to this sheet has been covered over the past few days, or even in earlier um, events here, where we all recognize that the food demand to up to 2050 will grow significantly um, and maybe well up to 70% from where we are today. Um, previous speakers have already highlighted, uh, I think uh, Greg has uh, shown that the uh, global demand in, will grow, uh, as the supply will as well. Um, we also see, saw that um, regulations are an important part um, that's all well accounted for. But I think if we look at Australia and uh, maybe in conjunction with that at the Netherlands, how are we then as exporters of food products um, going to uh, get into this game of attracting part of that export to our own farming and food uh, industries? I think I, I'd like to name three things that are out there. One is obviously the uh, scarce resource in land, water, um, already referred to, and actually even in Australia, as in the Netherlands, probably going down. Secondly, um, increasing trade, which means increasing focus on logistics, increasing understanding of value chains and supply chains, um, varying from getting your produce uh, to the end consumer, but also understanding that at the level of the end consumer, the supply chains may well be uh, less effective or organized than they are in our home, co home countries. And thirdly, and that was um, also already quite well referred to, competition is, uh, especially in uh, our coming years probably, more to come from local producers or producers in emerging markets than maybe from the old competition out of the Western world. Um, as uh, Lee already alluded to, um, I'm from Rabobank. I'm Dutch. You'll probably have recognized that from my accent. I'm not Australian, but I hope I'll be uh, made myself understood here uh, enough to take you through uh, a bit of a Dutch example and see where there's lessons to be learned. Australia from the Netherlands and vice versa. So here, unsurprisingly, I've uh, jotted down, or I've been helped to jot down, um, the global world export volumes, or uh, actually uh, the monetary side of it, um, of the 10 biggest countries in the world. The first one, obviously, to no surprise to anybody, would be the United States. They're big in any, anything, everything, uh, so they'll, they'll reach out in the first number in the chart here as well. The second one um, is the Netherlands. Uh, quite surprisingly, given that, um, to give you some perspective, uh, the Netherlands is about half the size of Tasmania. Um, so how do, we, how do we end up here? We'll come to that uh, in, in the rest of the presentation. Your other names are some very logical, number three, Brazil. Surprisingly, quite a few of these are fairly small countries, uh, certainly compared from an acreage perspective in, uh, when comparing to Australia, and um, our specialists like, uh, for instance, Italy or, or Spain, focusing on high quality, high value uh, goods. Um, Netherlands probably is somewhere more in the position of Australia, in a combination of uh, some high value, uh, but also some commodity type of products. Um, then I'd like to use the Netherlands as a, um, well, as a thread through the rest of the presentation to cover a few issues that, uh, that I think could help Australia to look at the coming years. First of all, taking a step back, which is the, um, what the economists dubbed the uh, Dutch disease. 1950s, um, a big 
amount of gas was discovered in the Netherlands, um, and that was exploited and ex actually exported starting in the mid-60s. This led to uh, various things that may or may not be uh, quite recognizable here in Australia, is that, first of all, our currency started to um, actually uh, be much stronger than before. A lot of the investments were attracted by energy and uh, related um, services. Uh, we got um, some wage increases that were related to, the in, to, the, uh, to this industry. Actually, our social, uh, social affairs were changing as well. Uh, in the end, it made the other exporting industries less competitive, or at least we were hindered by a currency effect. Um, to all of you here in Australia, probably not something that is uh, completely off the charts, and I would say uh, the effect it has had on the Dutch farmers is that they recognized that they needed to increase their productivity, their innovation, and go out there, because otherwise you were lost. Obviously, we know that currencies have moved, and maybe to the benefit uh, in, in Australia, uh, less strong than it used to be. I do remind people that that is compared to the US dollar, but not compared to the Brazilian reais or the uh, euro. So uh, yes, there is some benefit over, uh, over what's happened over the last year, but it may not be forever, and you can't depend only on that. So in what has happened over the, the growth of the um, exporters, you can see that the trend in, in the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands, the US, and um, Australia depicted here, the growth in uh, Australia has been around about 150%, um, the US 170%, but the Netherlands got up to 230%. Um, it's probably due to factors I mentioned earlier, productivity, the value adding and innovation that was uh, happening, um, and obviously the, the trade um, that was possible th given the location of the Netherlands. Um, and I think we, uh, we saw in our first presentation that the uh, location of Australia is sometimes too easily called as a uh, very easy at the doorstep of Asia. Uh, yes, there is a long stretch between Melbourne and Shanghai, but I must also say there's a lot of other stuff happening between Melbourne and Shanghai. Uh, and I think Indonesia is one of those countries that, uh, that is uh, closer and not per se to be delivered out of Melbourne. Um, I think that if we look at the, um, the, the comparison between Australia and the Netherlands, something else springs to, uh, to mind, um, that ultimately the, the split of the uh, exports is quite different. Um, you see that the Dutch production has been focused on the consumer-oriented products much more, and adding to uh, some, I think, 70% of it is, um, is purely focused on consumer-related uh, products, like uh, meats, dairy, fruit, and vegetables, whereas the Australian export, um, exports are more focused on commodity-type products like uh, cotton, grains, uh, pulses, um, and uh, less to the consumer-oriented side. The, um, the three largest Dutch export products, which I can give as an example, are, uh, for instance, nursery products, uh, cut flowers, um, flower bulbs, of which we cover about 80 to 90 percent of the world market, uh, dairy and fresh vegetables, as mentioned. Um, I raise this to emphasize a point on the question. I think both our agriculture uh, industries um, are currently confronted by whether to pursue the value part of the export or volume. And obviously, there's no one single right answer, but I think it is an important question to be answered in your businesses or in your trade organizations. What are the parts that we want to cover and how are we going to do this? Uh, they're not mutually exclusive. There will be potential to take either or, or have a combined uh, effect. Um, for some products, the situation, the decision on volume or value, 
uh, on the value add will be, uh, will be clear. Uh, however, I want to challenge you all that in our ability to try and capture a growing share of the global food demand, we need to think of the markets we are supplying. What role do we play? What role are we really set for uh, with, the, uh, well, with the goods that we have to work with, our land, our water, and our uh, capacity here locally? Um, the um, next and first uh, step I want to dig into is the uh, productivity in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands. Um, it's uh, clear that productivity is one thing. Um, it doesn't always, and we've seen that in some of the aspects in the Dutch um, uh, food producing uh, areas, it doesn't always lead to profitability. So uh, there is a, there's a bit of a sign of warning, be careful what you wish for, but uh, there, is, uh, there is a high level of uh, productivity in the Netherlands. As I said, Netherlands, small country, we have limited or, and very limited land resources and uh, very high uh, land prices. So, which have pushed farmers to look at intensification to actually uh, valorize that, uh, that limitation of resources and the high price of, uh, of land. Um, in, and as an example, in 2010, uh, about 10,000 hectares of glass houses were, uh, or greenhouses were set up in the Netherlands, and uh, half of these was used to grow vegetables. Um, by this uh, and by other uh, intensification and increased production, uh, the Netherlands actually ended up uh, at this moment of, um, to be responsible out of that small piece of land to be uh, responsible for 22% of the export of um, uh, potatoes and uh, even 56% of the seed potatoes. So there is a fairly uh, high uh, predict productivity, uh, which comes with a high market share as well, or which leads to hard mar high, high market shares. Um, on the land prices, um, obviously being a small country is one, there's the agricultural value, but there's also, given localization and urbanization, there's some spillover into prices of land close to uh, cities. But we have now reached a moment where we are um, close to uh, the equivalent of um, 100,000 Australian dollars per hectare. Um, and that is a price at which you, at this moment, probably could trade your land. Um, if you look at that, it also means that we now see about a equivalent of 6,000 6 to 7,000 Australian dollar of revenue per hectare in a normal crop plan of uh, a combined crop plan of uh, sugar beet, um, wheat, and potatoes. If you convert the same hectare and put on glass housing, you could even achieve a revenue of 1.2 uh, million. You would need to invest in the, in the greenhouses, though, uh, at, at probably some uh, million and a half per hectare. Um, then, a bit on farm structure. I think the, uh, we, we saw some pictures on farm structures and like uh, many, uh, many uh, developed markets, the number of farms has decreased significantly over the last uh, 20 years. Um, in the Netherlands, we probably uh, concentrate, or we probably we concentrate by uh, about 45%. So there's 45% less farmers now than there were in 1990. Um, I think in Australia it is going at a slower pace, more like 20%. Uh, it is also to do about concentration and increasing productivity. Um, so the upgrade of consolidation of land, the um, setting up land, there's also the typical Dutch structure that has helped that is to organize both by government and actually instated by law to um, see to it that farms are operated at an effective plot of land, meaning that um, trying to get farmers and their, farm, uh, and their farms um, in the midst of their land, instead of having plots scattered around their farms or have long, uh, uh, long stretches of land instead of more rectangular lands, most of that reorganization has been done over the past 50 years 
but it has helped to increase productivity as well. Um, obviously, this has this been a government steered, uh, but all, uh, to see to it that you get an equivalent of, or uh, your your ownership isn't harmed. This is all uh, instated by a, a specific law as well. Um, this has been supported by further um, uh, subsidies or etc. Then. The other part that helped productivity is the um, uh, is the um, golden triangle, um, where we uh, combine our research, uh, especially Wageningen and uh, the uh, the parts that are established there, our education, which is partly Wageningen, but also a lot of other um, schooling that's been done at the agricultural level for all levels needed, so right from the start up to the PhD at Wageningen, and the extension services that have been promoted by government and have been uh, mostly privatized over the last years. Um, and that's, that's a good help in the uh, improved uh, productivity. If we then go to uh, where is the next step of what's happened in uh, the uh, the benefit of what, where have we created our value, is the um, adding value to the uh, to the agricultural trade. The hub of um, the Netherlands is, in one way, perfect to uh, import a lot of goods, then process them, add value, and re-export them. Obviously, the location, the proximity to a big market, which I'll allude to a bit later on, is helpful, but it also requires that you see that you can add value, make money on that, and find your uh, markets where actually there's demand for this more further processed food. Um, I think that ultimately, uh, if you look at this and you take a next example, which is a quite surprising example in one way, is how the Dutch have um, kept going at the, um, at the um, uh, chocolate trade. That is a particularly uh, funny situation in one way because the Dutch have no cocoa beans whatsoever uh, growing at, uh, at their local, other local presence. Historically, obviously, as a trade nation, we have been able to import a lot of cocoa, process it in the various parts that cocoa needs to be processed into, and actually redistribute and uh, create even uh, fairly renowned chocolate companies either in the Netherlands or um, pushed them into Belgium or they got into Belgium and you create one uh, significant um, food, well significant in the sense of our share, maybe not significant in the total value but it's, it is a, a prime example of how you can add value in a trade flow. Then an example of how um, the innovation, uh, which is another part of what needs to be done to keep going at your exports, or at least at, uh, at a, in, in, in creating your value, you need to come up with innovative ideas. And the Netherlands has a long tradition of cooperation between the public and the private sector to uh, uh, improve that. I, I've mentioned the Golden Triangle earlier, um, and the Dutch government will uh, support R&D um, or has supported R&D over time and sees that that has value as well. There is now a need increase, uh, there's still, and I think that's true for Australia as well, an increasing large uh, uh, demand for further R&D um, investments. Uh, I think that that's a struggle. Um, we, we are getting money into that. I think the concentration of Wageningen and its university also attracts a lot of smaller spin-offs that in the end get financed. But I think that both in Australia and in the Netherlands, the, 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 the question is how do we fund our R&D and our startups and our innovation is, is one to be uh, considering closely. Uh, the example on, on this sheet is about a new way of um, producing uh, what is so-called rondel eggs, um, where there's a combination of um, the ultimate, you could say the consumer demand of having uh, eggs come from a more sustainable, 
um, animal-friendly environment, and where that's been in a process where actually the efficiency hasn't been harmed. There is a uh, way you could produce this, and it's been set up in a commercial franchisee system, which actually is beneficial to the farmers that are using it. So the innovation is not only about the technical side of it, there's also a marketing aspect to it. Then um, we couldn't talk about the development of Dutch um, uh, markets if we don't look at the position of the Netherlands in, its, uh, in, in a broader perspective. Uh, the, the harbor of Rotterdam already mentioned, if I, if I would draw a circle around it of some 700 kilometers, which is um, a reasonable logic circle, given that that's a one day trucking um, uh, distance, you would find uh, this part of Europe in the proximity of Rotterdam. Um, obviously the truck to London would be a bit hard, but the, in other ways it, it is possible. Um, and uh, the good thing about uh, London, it's easier even uh, by sea. Um, and this is, this is one of the ways we have really uh, covered. The circle actually entails about 150 million people. Um, so what are the, the, the modes are probably quite known, uh, the Rhine running from Rotterdam uh, way down to Switzerland and many other rivers and uh, canals uh, um, attached to it. Uh, we, have, um, we have obviously the road, we have uh, rail, and um, not so much in Rotterdam, but in Amsterdam, which is uh, less than uh, 60 kilometers away, we have a fairly strong hub at the, uh, at the uh, transport uh, by air, um, which is for food and agri, maybe not always the uh, logical means of transport, but for instance, for our, the whole flower trade, it's an extremely important um, transport mode where we see a lot of coming and going of flowers that are actually not even all grown in the Netherlands, but we may well be uh, coming out of Africa or South America. So that's all nice um, to look at uh, the Netherlands sitting here in Canberra, um, but is this really, um, is this really comparable? What, uh, what are we uh, to do? Um, there are difference, uh, differences, yes. Um, there are many differences, um, but what are we going to do? And if we look at this, I could say, well, this would be looking a bit more like the windmill that's uh, displaced. So are we, are we actually using the right examples here? Um, earlier in the session, we heard from speakers talking about the growth of food demand in Asia and also the importance of trade for Australia. And Australia's ability to ca capture this global growth and utilize some of the market access opportunities depends on its ability to supply the market. In effect, it's the third variable in the equation. If you have demand and market access, then you must have the supply to meet it. So let's see um, what form should that supply take. Um, and here, the, here we come to the volume and, and, uh, and value proposition again. If you look at these two cost comparisons, uh, the, left, uh, the left one um, comparing wheat prices, uh, production prices, and the right one dairy, you see that on the left side, the uh, cost of wheat in, in Australia are on the, at the wrong side if you take it from a consumer perspective or from a demand perspective. In the dairy side, uh, Australia and New Zealand are still very cost competitive, but have lost quite a bit of cost competitiveness to other markets, let alone that, uh, as we saw earlier, some domestic competition may come up for some sort of uh, dairy production, uh, even in places like China. Um, so that's, that is something to uh, really um, take care of. Um, the creation of value added opportunities um, might be a strategy to uh, obtain greater returns from the global growth scenario, similar to the Dutch situation where we capitalized on what resources we have and our leaders in uh, greenhouse production. Australia should focus on, uh, at least for part of the effort, on specializing and become a high value added delivery of products 
in what is a market that is maybe a bit further away than people estimate, but it's still close enough to be able to deliver the goods that the end consumer is looking for. Um, Grass-fed production, uh, beef production is one of those examples. One thing we must remember is that in supplying agriculture products to the world, it is the whole chain that matters, and we can't be uh, the most efficient, cost-effective, and then get completely lost at the end of the supply chain and, and, be, and lose our competitiveness. Um, looking at integrated supply chains uh, and places where you can develop products and maybe even sometimes decommoditize what is perceived as a commodity can help to uh, increase exports and fend off competition from potential lower cost uh, production, uh, production locations. I, um, I think that that ultimately um, is the um, crux of the matter. Where, where do you want to go in that whole value versus volume uh, debate? Is this something that you could only do by chasing volume? No, I wouldn't say that that would be the right direction. I think the integration of value chains, the creating uh, specialist products and listen very good to ultimate the uh, consumers that are at a doorstep, maybe a bit of a further doorstep, but they are still on your doorstep. That would be uh, the way that you could create further exports to improve and increase the capacity uh, of the Australian farming and uh, food industry. Thank you.